Oh, you did it on your own. That's awesome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dean Delfos. I'm one of the pastors here at Country Bible, and we're really glad to have you among us. If you're visiting with us especially, welcome to you, to the church family. Much love and grace to you. Um, thank you just for making this a regular part of your weekly time together. Um, this morning, just before we get started in earnest, um, let me just point your attention to the bulletin that you were handed at the door. If you open it up on the right side, you'll see news of things that are coming up. Just want to point out two in particular. Um, the Stephen Ministry sign-up that's happening. Um, this is a way that you can be trained in ministry to walk alongside others who are going through a tough time. Um, so Stephen Ministry training is happening, coming soon. So please be mindful of that and sign up for that for information. And then also the fellowship meal that's coming up on November 13th. Uh, please be mindful of that as well. You see details in there and other things in the bulletin for you to take note of and be mindful of and plan and be praying for. Um, this morning, um, just wanted to also call your attention to a um, prayer request that I received um, just a few days ago um, saying that um, today on Sunday, October 23rd, um, Christians just from around the world have set aside today to be in prayer for Iran and for the believers that are in Iran amidst the conflict that's happening there. So this morning, as we transition to our time of worship together and we go together in, in prayer before the Lord, I wanted to ask you to remember them especially. Um, and so for them and for all the other missionaries that are connected to our church family, please be in prayer. Scripture calls us to worship, so would you stand and let us uh, hear the word of the Lord together? Listen to how Psalm 95 calls us together to exalt the Lord. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Because the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for providing this time of worship. We thank you for this time of gathering. We ask and pray that not only would you saturate um, by the presence of your Holy Spirit this time together, with the truth of the gospel and um, encouragements to our faith in you, but also we ask for believers around the world, especially in Iran, that you would strengthen them amidst the things that they're going through and their present suffering and provide shelter and strength for them and support. Um, we pray that you'd help them persevere in their faith and through what they're experiencing, draw many to yourself. And so we ask for blessings not only on them, um, but also on us as we gather. And as we remind ourselves through these songs of your greatness to us and your greatness of who you are as a whole and how you just rule over all things with wisdom and might, we pray for your blessing on our service this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. Ransomed from the 
Everybody knows the lyrics to that song, right? Ha! 
unto thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art.
You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your breath. this beautiful morning that we can gather under your banner, brothers and sisters, to worship and praise your name, to study your word. I ask that you would uh, guide George this morning and, and open our hearts that we would be able to uh, absorb his message and your word. We thank you for your son Jesus and his sacrifice. I ask that you would go with each of us through the upcoming week, that we would um, be a witness to your mercy, grace, love to others. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Country Bible Church. Um, I can see there's a few less chairs than there were last week. I shouldn't have told them that I was going to preach again. <laughs> so, 
Well, I'll tell you what, what was really moving is in that last song when we were singing the refrain of great are you Lord, I felt the building shaking. So it was, it was good. It was good. So, um, this morning I want to c- continue with First Thessalonians. And uh, if you're visiting this morning, my name is George Lockyer. I too am one of the pastors here. Dean, who opened us, if you're visiting, is our usual preaching pastor, and I am not, but he spent the week training um, pastors on preaching, and it's probably something I should have taken the course on, but um, I tend to lean more towards, my gifting is in teaching, and um, to me, a preacher has a gift of, if you want to call prophecy, of declaring the word of God. And teaching, the difference between the two is that Dean is really an exhorter. He takes the word of God and, and brings it out and exhorts us and moves us to action. And teaching is that it's just basically the ability to communicate clearly the word of God. So I feel like I can do that um, most of the time. Um, apparently, I can do it because I got this note from a young child here. Um, I know it's a young child by the handwriting and the spelling, but it's a great sermon. Thank you so much for taking your time to tell me and my family about God. So, all right. So the kids in here, I'm going to reach you, you but um, but it's it's a great privilege always to bring the word of God to you, and in doing so with uh, First Thessalonians and um, today. Well, last week I got you out a little bit early by doing eight verses. Today I only have four verses. So guess what? You're not going to get out of it as early. <laughs> I told the first hour, I think I told you this last year, last week, is that as I was finishing last week, the first service, is that the music team had another song to do at the end. And I was at a point where I realized I only have like about two minutes left in my notes here. And I looked up and the music team was not here. Uh, and they were nowhere to be found. So I went into a long prayer. Uh, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> they finally showed up. So you would n- note on your bulletin this morning is that there is no song after I'm done. Uh, uh, but... Again, a great privilege this morning. And this morning I'm going to be covering 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. And, um, and, and from my study of this, it's, it's really been a fascinating study, and particularly looking at the whole writing of the book of Thessalonians and Paul's, um, and, and Paul penning this and, and kind of trying to think into Paul's mind of what was going on with him. He's, it's the church that he established, and, uh, and now he's away from it, and he sends Timothy, and Timothy comes back with a report to him, and the book is, is kind of a, it's, a, it's an interesting picture of what's going on there, because there's a lot that he commends the church for, and we'll see even today, that he, he commends them for some things, but at the same time, he is correcting lots of things along the way. And um, he, he reminded me of, of what I tried to be as a coach, of, is that in the performances of my teams and my athletes, is you're always looking for good things in the midst of it, and then addressing the, the things that need to be corrected along the way. And in, as a coach, is nobody ever does it perfect. You, know, you, you can always exhort them to go further. And so my, what I try to do in my coaching is always, always start off with the positives. And sometimes the positives are hard to find, but you always start out with some positives for the athlete. And, and then after that, you start correcting things. And, and usually what you do is you, you kind of do it in order of things. So what is, the, what is the most obvious thing that we have to address? And Paul did that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is that he, he starts off last week saying, is that, okay, you, you are lacking in some things. And so here, 
that where we're going to start with, with where you're lacking, is that he's, he's going to say you, you were doing this and you need to incur, be encouraged with that, but here's the first thing we need to address. And so where you're lacking is that here's the will of God, is that your, it's your sanctification. And if you were here last week, when you talk about sanctification, we're talking about the will of God to a believer. Is to an unbeliever, God's will for them is justification first. But here's believers in the city of Thessalonica, and he wants to encourage them, and the very first thing to address is sexual immorality. <coughs> Excuse me. Ooh. Don't do that in the microphone. Um, but in, with that is then afterwards he wants to bring up some other things in regards to them. And, and they are important. Everything is important. But here he's basically going to break it down for them. And again, it's, it's, it seems to be that generally the church was doing well. It's just that there, it'd be like any church, is that there are some people who are struggling here. There are some people here and there, and so he seems to be addressing these kinds of things to say, let's, let's get better, let's get better, Let, let's do things more and more better, and abound more in that. So I hope you'll see that today in this message that Paul brings to us, and, and what, um, what he wants to start off with is that he wants to start off with walking in obedience to it, but the, let the, as we mentioned last week, is that this obedience needs to be based upon affection for Christ, not out of duty. If I do things out of duty, then I'm just, I'm just working hard at it. And, but what he wants us to do is to be doing things and listening to the word of God, and we're gonna, get, we're gonna see some commands from God today listening to these commands and out of affection is that I want to do this, my affection for Jesus Christ. So let's pray and then we'll get into these verses. Lord, thank you for your word and, and thank you that we can take a look at these verses today. And not only were they things to, to be addressed 2,000 years ago, but it directly impacts us this very day. So as we do so, let our our minds dwell upon the, the Spirit and what, he, what the Spirit wants to bring out in our own lives and understanding of these verses. And I pray for my communication of this, that it would be clear, be concise, and that people would be able to see God's, your, your intention in these words. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I titled them the message this morning, they'll know we are Christians by our, and right away, most of you will come up with love, right? Well, he has more. He says, no, there's more to our, if you want to say, how does the world know who we are? No, it's, it's that it isn't just going to be by our love. He starts with that, and that's the foundation of it. But there's far more. There's far more that comes with it. So let me start by reading the verses we'll cover today. From Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, this first one, chapter 4, starting with verse 9. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may live properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. Okay, so let's take a look at these verses here, and starting with verse 9, where he, he says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And he starts out with this now concerning, and it's basically the word about. And so it's talking about this. And it appears that he, by the, the way it's written, that he's responding to some sort of communication that was given to him, probably by Timothy's report, and that there was a question about brotherly love. And so, so it brings this out now, now about or now concerning brotherly love with this. 
Um, probably most of you realize the, the word brotherly love is, is in the Greek is the word Philadelphia. Uh, we know it as the city of brotherly love. But the word in its um, original form, it, it basically it's the word for those who are a brother or sister by birth. And, and so with that is with, why would we use that for terms within the church? Well, the thing is, is that it's meant to communicate is that those of us who have been born again by the Spirit of God through faith in Jesus Christ is that we've been reborn. We've been born again. And so with somebody else who's born by that same spirit of, is that then we have this connection. We have this bonding of brotherhood and sisterhood because in us is the same spirit of God. And so by birth, we are connected in that terms. And so this term brotherly love is used by Paul throughout the New Testament. And with this is that Paul, when he oftentimes will speak and name people in his writings, in his letters, is that he does it using family language. And in the book of Ephesians, he even uses the word that we are the household of God. You know, we, we're under the same roof. We're, we're brothers. We're sisters. And what's interesting is the end of chapter 16, when he goes through a long list of people in the church there, and just some of the connections and the words that he uses it for him. You see, you can see my sister, fellow workers, kinsmen, my beloved, my fellow worker, my kinsmen, the beloved. And he even says Rufus' mother. She was like a mother to me as well. And then he has greet all these other people and the brothers. And on and on he goes. And he uses family language when he talks about others in the church. And so it gives us a little bit of an idea of this brotherly love. And brotherly love also, it, it, it brings about to, to God's church is that there's no social classes, there's no ethnic groups, there, there's no free and slaves, men and women, there's no social boundaries with it. You know, one of the things that's <clears throat> kind of sad sometimes in churches is when we, when we have churches that are divided up, whether it's ethnically or by some sort of thing that goes about in regards to it. It's because we're, we're all brothers and sisters in regards to that. And, and Paul even says in Colossians 3, 11, that there is no Greek and Jew and circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. Christ is all and in all. So our relationships are bound and found in our common faith in Jesus Christ. And so Paul goes on to, to say with this is that, <clears throat> that you, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And this, this is fascinating that, to um, study this word uh, taught by God, is <clears throat> that in, in the Greek it's this word theodiketo, and... Um, which just means God and, and didache is the word for teaching or for instruction with this. And for instance, if you wanted to, to look up a, a really interesting document from church history, it's called the didache. And it is known as the first document that was outside the scriptures, the actual writings of the apostles. And they're not sure, but they're, they're pretty sure that it was written within 100 years of the, the apostles and probably put together by those who were direct disciples of the apostles, and even some think that maybe John had something to do with part of the writing of it. And the, the Didache is kind of like our constitution for this church. If you, you want to know what is it like to be a, a church member, how do you do baptism, how do you do the Lord's Supper, and, and other things with it. The Didache was kind of an explanation by these early men for the church is that this is the way you do things in regards to it. And it's, it's a fascinating document to study. But anyway, here, this word God taught, you don't find it anywhere else. In other words, Paul made it up. This is, this is Paul's word, God taught. And, but, but what's interesting in taking a look at this, when he, when he makes that statement that about brotherly love, you've been taught by God, 
is that in through the scriptures here, and I'll give these to you here a little bit, is to realize that it mentions the Father, the Son, and the Spirit as teachers of this, about brotherly love. And, and one thing is, and how do we know that it's God, what God taught is, in Isaiah 54, 13, here we, we see that um, Isaiah wrote, all your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. So that was a prophetic statement. And then you go to John 6, 45, and Jesus brings about this in regards to that um, prophetic statement from Isaiah. It's written by the prophets, and they will be all taught by God. And everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And so it's saying is that there's something that comes from the Father that moves us to Jesus. And, uh, and they received, and so what it is is that those who are born again in Christ is that you, there is an instruction that goes on with us. And, in, and it comes about by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit where the fruit of the Spirit is, first of all, it says the fruit of the Spirit, of, in other words, the evidence of the Spirit in you is love. It's the very first one that's mentioned, and it's an evidence of grace. It's an evidence of the work of grace in my life, not of my works, but God working through me. The evidence of it is love. And then Jesus. So we got the Father, we got the Spirit, and now what does Jesus say? Uh, what he tells us, in John 13, 34 through 35, that there's a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know you are my disciples. That's important to where we're going to go with these verses in 1 Thessalonians. If you have love for one another... And then he states in John 15, 12 and 17, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. The beauty of it is God as a teacher is this, is that God speaks that, okay, you will be taught by me and the spirit comes about to inspire in me love. But what does it look like? I look to the Jesus. Jesus then becomes the flesh living out of what this brotherly love is all about. And it becomes the hallmark of his teaching. And it's the paradigm of what the, the cross was all about, is that by love, Jesus went to the cross and, and to serve us and to die for us. And so, the, so that, along with the evidences of the work of the Holy Spirit, give me an idea of just what does he mean by brotherly love? And the, one of the things that was really interesting, when, when Dean gave me these verses um, and to ask to preach upon them is, is how God was just preparing me for it. It's the reason why I'm, I'm fully into the sovereignty of God. Some of the things is the first one is that last week teaching about sanctification. Well, about um, two months ago, I read a book on sanctification. Of. And so it was called Yes, It Matters, and it was on sanctification. So, and then I started reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together, and that's on brotherly love. So, so let, me, let me read to you a little bit from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together. And um, if you're not familiar with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, just real quickly, is that he was a pastor in Germany in, in the 1930s and 1940s. And uh, during the rise of Hitler and the Nazi regime, regime there, and that he was, uh, you know, if you want to say, a, a firebrand preacher and was not going to be not compromised to what was happening in his country with, with the Nazi. But at the same time, he, he, he didn't want to necessarily be on the radar. And it's a little bit of what we're going to see here Paul talk about in regards to it. So it got to a point that he was so distressed that he did come to the United States and did some preaching in the United States for a while, but was really, his heart was back with the people of Germany. So he returned back to Germany right in the beginning of the war and, and um, eventually was arrested by uh, the orders of Hitler and then executed, hung 
and um, with it as well. But in the meantime, is that his preaching, and he he did he wrote several books, and and one of them, and and I would really recommend this for if you're in a community group and you're wondering what are some things we can do, you know, if they, of course studying the Bible, but just taking a look, how can we grow in our understanding of community together? Is get it's only like 80 pages, is get this book, Life Together, by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and it'll give you a real clear understanding of what it is to love one another and how to live in community with one another. Um, and, I, and I thank my brother, Fred Mills, for putting me on to reading the book on that. But, but this comes from <clears throat> the book itself, where what he does, he distinguishes it as spiritual love versus human love. So... The, the love that comes from the Holy Spirit and then there's the love that we have as humans. And, and, and what he starts off right here is to realize that it's one of the things, we all know this, if you watch some of the people who are not believers and some of the demonstrations of what we would call love or at least char- charity and other things, they really outdo us. And, and, and he addresses that here with it, and where he says, human love is capable of remarkable sacrifice that often surpasses genuine Christian love and fervent devotion and visible results, and even speaks the Christian language with overwhelming and stirring eloquence. But it's what Paul is speaking of in 1 Corinthians 13.3, where he says, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So human love is directed to the other person, but it's to his own sake, spiritual love for Christ's sake. Therefore, human love seeks contact with the other person, and it loves him not as a free person, but one whom it binds to itself. It wants to gain something, to be captured by any means. It will use force desires to be irresistible and to rule them. It cannot love an enemy where it can no longer expect its desire to be fulfilled. There it stops short, namely in the face of an enemy. There it turns into hatred, contempt, and slander. Jesus Christ stands between the lover and the others he loves. What love is, only Christ tells in his word. Spiritual love does not desire, but rather serves. It loves an enemy as a brother. It originates neither in the brother nor in the enemy, but in Christ and his word. Human love cannot understand it, for it's from above. It's completely strange. It is new and incomprehensible. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. This is the scripture's praise of life together. Jesus Christ is our unity and he is our peace. And through him alone do we have access to one another, joy in one another, and fellowship with one another. So, so Paul goes on and in, in this verse here, in the next verse, verse 10, and says, For indeed, this brotherly love is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. So again, here, here's the coach in Paul saying, Hey, you're doing all right. You're doing okay. You're, you're even in, in such a way that um, <clears throat> he, he, he's saying that there's apparently some evidences of this and of genuine love that is going even outside the congregation into the region. And they're seeing this. It's noticeable throughout the whole region. And their concern for others is impressive. And it's, it's noticed. And, and the region would be Macedonia is about 110 miles so it, it's kind of like the, where we are to Grand Island. And imagine is that we, we were a church. We are a church. But imagine just what we're doing as a church and stuff like that was just known all the way through all the churches all the way to Grand Island. So, and, and that's what he's saying about this church in the city of Thessal- uh, Thessalonica is that <clears throat> throughout the whole region, they, they know what's going on. They're, they're seeing this. But what does Paul do? He says, do it more and more. So it's, it's that good job, but keep excelling. Keep excelling. The, the word literally means to abound more and more. Don't quit. 
And, 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 and part of the reason for this is that um, what, what would be the sign that you've arrived? <laughs> you know, and he's basically saying, there, we, I don't know what that is. I don't know when you've arrived in loving enough. So just keep abounding and keep doing it and do that. And so <clears throat> um, it, it's to motivate this honorable life and to add. But now what he wants to do is saying, okay, going back to chapter 3 when he says, I, I'm, I am going to supply what is lacking here. And so here's what he's going to do. He's going to say, let, let me address some things now with this. Abound more and more, but let's address some things with this. So the first thing he says in verse 11 is, is that I want you to, in verse 10 to, to tell them that we urge you brothers to do this more and more. And now let me, let me bring this clarity to you to aspire to live quietly. This is kind of like a, a contradiction in the Greek with that. It, it's, it could be translated almost to say like, make it your ambition to have no ambition. And, and, or make an effort to do nothing. You know, you're going, wait a minute. You know, aspire. In other words, okay, I, I got to move to live quietly. I got to back up. You know, it is, it, so it, it seems odd at what he's getting at here. But these kinds of things are things that you have to take a look at. A bigger picture is, is just what has Paul said elsewhere. And so we get a bigger picture of what this is about. And uh, is that what it, what it would imply here is this, is that you, you, you're not to be living this life of tension, of worry, doubt, anxiety, and, and, and all these things that kind of take away a quiet life, but it is what, what a quiet life, the picture of it is just restful joy. I'm okay. I'm okay. And, and with it, it's an essential ingredient is, is that he, he's saying, don't be full of tension. Don't be full of worry. Don't be full of doubt. Don't be, um, have this anxiety, but rest. Rest in things. And, and it is, in a, we're going to see, it is an essential ingredient in influencing other people about the gospel. If somebody's going to come up and share the gospel to me and the person's a wreck, so I'm going to, I don't want any piece of that. Uh, and, and in fact, it, you know, for in my personal life, is, um, I, I was one time crewed in the military with a guy and we would spend, we'd have to spend two days together locked up in a missile silo together. And so, and this guy was professing to be a Christian and he'd bring his Bible and, and all these other kinds of things. And I, I was not a believer and, and, you know, I had some interest with it, but his life was in wreck. And I'm thinking, I don't want any piece of this. <laughs> So is the, if this is what it leads to in your life. I, I just, it's just not attractive to me at all. And, and so 1 Timothy chapter 2, watch what Paul says here about a quiet life. He says, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high places, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And this is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So see that he's connecting here about the people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He's connecting it to the way you live your life. And so, this is, so what Paul's saying to them is aspire to this. Get a quiet life. It's Cool down and get these tensions and worry, things like that, is take care of those kinds of things, which he does give instruction along the way in this letter and other letters in regards to this. But he, right now, he's just 
speaking to this church here and just saying abound more and more in love and some of you, your lives are wrecks. Is hey, fine, restful joy. Cool it. And then he goes to the second item to it. Is, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. In other words, what he's saying is mind your own business. And this is kind of odd to hear okay, by Paul. And it's something to, for us to, to see properly in regards to this. Okay, and so, um, because we don't know what the issues are, why he's saying this in regards to the people of this church, but he's just telling them you need to mind your affairs. And basically what he's saying is don't meddle into other people's affairs and concentrate more on your own life issues. Now, when he's saying this right here is, again, is, is taking a look at, you know, how does Paul spell this out throughout other writings in regards to this. So this, this doesn't mean that I don't, I don't help somebody else with it, but it means you don't stick your nose in their lives where you're basically uninvited. You know, there's a, there's a big difference, you know, because I've had this happen to me, where somebody's coming up and, and they want to, they may not want to know something that's going on that I'm involved with or, or just to see something in my life. And a, and a brother or sister in Christ comes and asks questions that go into my personal life. Well, there's a big difference between somebody who does that and is able to frame in the midst of it is because I want to help you. I want to pray for you. I want to come alongside you with this than the person who just wants information. Okay, it's just, the, hey, I heard this. And all they want to do is build this inventory of information in regards to it. And what does that oftentimes lead to? It's, is that in Proverbs, it talks about how how wonderful it is to eat gossip and fill your belly with it. So, and sometimes that's what it's about, is that they just heard and, hey, you know, I'd love to have some information that maybe I could share with some other people <laughs> in, in regards to it. And I, and I think this is what Paul's talking about here, is, is that um, th th there's a rule th that when, when I talk to people about Slander and gossip, and, and this is not necessarily slander. Slander would be lying. But gossip is actually, you, you could be sharing truth about somebody. But what you're doing is you're sharing truth with somebody that it's none of your business. And it's not the business of the person I'm sharing it with. And, and so that's what gossip is, is sharing information that really you're, you're not helping in the situation in regards to that. And I think that's what Paul's trying to get to here. And, and what, he, what he says in um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3.11, which we'll get back to also here in a moment, he says, we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but your busybodies. Okay, what's a busybody? Well, a busybody is just somebody who sticks their nose in somebody else's business. Uh, and, and the problem is, again, is that oftentimes they share it with other people. So Paul says, you know, is that I, we hear that some of you were doing that kind of thing, and it's kind of like knock it off. Uh, so along with that, we take a look at the last thing he just mentioned at verse, is that he says, and to work with your hands as we instructed you. And here now realize that manual labor was typically done by hired workers and slaves in their culture. And we, we don't know exactly, again, what he's addressing in this situation. But um, some commentaries mention that, and, and Pastor Dean will be getting into this as he gets into the verses about the coming of the Lord, is that there was confusion over the second coming of Jesus. And apparently some of them were just saying, Jesus is coming, then I'm not going to work anymore because we're going. And, and apparently there was just some confusion in how they were living out their lives based upon that. <clears throat> Whether that was so or not, it's possible it was. We don't have clear evidence that that was it. But um, in anticipation of it, it seems that if that was the case, then some of them were just quitting their jobs and just sitting around waiting to 
for the coming of, of the Lord with this. So Paul is exhorting them, no, you continue to work hard and you support yourself and you're not to be a burden to other people by your own will and, and by your own doing. He's not condemning unemployment. It is that in other places in scripture, he mentions about those who are in situations that are beyond them and that you come alongside them in a responsibility to um, help those people. He's talking about the person who chooses not to work, the, the person who is, he calls it idleness, the person who's just being lazy. And, and, and what Paul does in chapter 2, verse 9, is um, what he says here is, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So again, what Paul is condemning is idleness with this. In fact, he says in the second letter of Thessalonians, starting with verse 7, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anybody's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. And it was not because we did not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. So once again, is, is that Paul's just saying is that those who are that way, don't help them. Don't help them. Is, is that that's what you need to do is you just need to exhort them, hey, get to work. Uh, and, and so the question is why all that instruction that Paul's given here? And, and, and what he does is he, he provides for us. Why, why is Paul... He, again, he compliments them and then all of a sudden says, hey, we've got to address this, we've got to address this, we've got to address this to that. Well, verse 12 now gives us why. So, so that, here's the reason, that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. And to walk properly basically is to literally walk with decorum and respect, is that we as Christians should walk with respect. There should be a decorum. Our heads should be up high, you know, and, and we, we should be walking straight and with it is, is that, and that's what, what he's talking about here, and, and especially to unbelievers, uh, that they see something that is about us that is different than for them. And it's, it means to walk in a fitting manner, act nobly, worthy of recognition to receive respect rather than censure. And, and this was, is that in um, what's going to be coming up pretty soon is um, we're, we're going to be presenting before you men to be elders here. And, and in doing so is to realize that one of the first requirements for an elder is this, is he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. It's the requirement of an elder to basically is to have a reputation to outsiders that they would be so with this. And it's implied in chapter 4, verse 1, is that we read last week, is that finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to live and to please God just as you're doing, do so more and more. And <clears throat> so the way we present ourselves to the world is that if, if we're not doing these things that he had just listed for us in, in terms of, of not living quietly, of not working with our hands, those kinds of things, is that that's not going to impress the world. Uh, is, you know, who wants to be part of that? And so, so this, he says that we're not to be dependent on anyone, not to be dependent on no one. And, you know, those who are self-sufficient are considered virtuous by the culture and the ethic of work. But, and, and to realize that for us is that we want, we want to be dependent upon no one. 
is that, in other words, we, I want to be a worker who, like Paul says, is that even, even what we were doing, we, it took us working night and day, but we didn't have to depend upon you. I paid for the stuff that I was eating and things like that. And, and, and that's part of the creation mandate for us. To, to work is part of what God demanded of us from the very beginning, is that in Genesis chapter 1, called the, this is considered the creation mandate, it says, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God's intention for us is that he's given us the creation. So he's given us all these things. He's given us the creation, and he says, now you subdue and have dominion over it. In other words, you take my creation now and work it. You work it, and you work it for his glory. You work it for his good. Uh, and so that's what we're, we were born and destined to do, uh, is, to, is to do that kind of work in regards to it. And then what Paul brings to us now is a two-dimension world, insiders and outsiders. Okay, so insiders obviously being my Christian life, stuff, and my Christian life is my life, but there's the outsiders with it. And so, um, so this like two-dimension world that we participate in, and what he says, he wants you to walk properly amongst these outsiders and be dependent on no one. And so with that, is, is similar to um, <clears throat> that we live in this outside world. And this is very similar to what God called for Israel, is that when God was disciplining Israel, um, is in, here they were living in Jerusalem in the city of God, and what God does is he takes them and he moves them to Babylon. And, and what's great is, is to watch the instruction that was given to God's people in Babylon, where it says in Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Which, first of all, to realize this is that God is the one who sent them. Babylon didn't do it. So if God moved Babylon to move his people and to provide for us a great model in the midst of that because we are basically living in Babylon <laughs> in our culture. And, but he says this to them, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare, you will find your welfare. And so what we see here is what God tells them, okay, you're taken from this city and I'm moving you into this worldly place, Babylon. And when I move you in there, then I want you to thrive in there. I want you to build houses. I want you to have families. And I want you to pray for the welfare of Babylon. And by praying for the welfare of Babylon is that you will find your welfare in the midst of it. So how are we to live in this world today? How are we living in the world? The same thing. It's the same thing. We are to thrive in this world God's way in regards to it. We're demanded by Paul in other places is to pray. We're to pray for kings. We're to pray for those in power and authority. And we do those kinds of things. We don't walk into sin with them, but we pray. But we live our lives out as those who are the household of God. So we, we, engage, we engage ourselves in the social and economic institutions of our culture here, and we embrace and distinguish ourselves as we are people of faith. We are people who love Jesus Christ and that we worship God through Jesus Christ. John MacArthur, in writing about these particular verses here, he says that the key to evangelism is the integrity of the lives of Christians who manifest to a troubled, agitated, messed up world a behavior that is filled with love and peace and tranquility and privacy and diligent work. And when Christians live that kind of life in the world, people are going to say, you guys are different. There's something different about you guys. And so 
with that is, you know, what is the world going to know us by? Well, yeah, they'll know we're Christians by our love. They'll also know us that how quietly we live our lives, how we mind our own affairs, how we work with our hands, and how we walk before outsiders. So Paul's exhortation 2,000 years ago falls on us today, very relevant and true. Um, uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the beauty of this message, and thank you for what you've brought to us through Jesus Christ, and that we would indeed abound more and more in our love for one another, and that we would live out these, these exhortations of living out a quiet life, that we would move away from the troubles and anxieties of this world. And, and, and where needed to is, the, is to have people when it's needed, such as the, the ministry of Stephen's ministry, to bring us to that point for those who struggle in this area. But also, Lord, that to a world outside of us, uh, we would demonstrate the power, the glory, and the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. And so now, as, he, as you are able to keep us from stumbling and to present us blameless before the presence of your glory with great joy, to the only God and our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all time, both now and forevermore, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And with that, you're dismissed. Thank you.